thank you everyone for sitting here with us. I think we have a really uh, interesting topic to discuss a little bit uh, off from what we're usually talking about. Um, and also really great um, you know, people here with us on the panel. So I'd like to just start um, by uh, asking everyone here, has anyone here ever been cyber bullied or know anyone who has been cyber bullied? Right, and, it, and then from that, knowing those people, did they know what to do after it happened? Right, so that's, that's one thing we're gonna talk about here today. So, but first let's introduce everyone. We have uh, Brooke Meshiko. Hi everybody, my name is Brooke. Um, what, do you, what do you want me to say? Um, and then we also have a Lieutenant Rivera. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Felix Rivera, I'm the squad commander for the NYPD's Computer Crime Squad, and I also serve as the uh, New York City Internet Crimes Against Children uh, commander. Thank you. And then we also have Barry Miller, my uh, partner from Freeman Mathis and Gary in Kentucky. Thank you, Alicia. I, I'm in the Lexington, Kentucky office. I'm co-chair of our coverage group, so I was glad to see another coverage lawyer this morning and, uh, and glad to see that nobody booed him. And, uh, but um, I've also been extremely interested in the technology, technology side of the law since I started practicing in 1988 and uh, my partners were convinced that computers were a fad that were going to go away. So um, that's, that's why I'm here today. It's kind of led to, to, uh, to this panel. Thanks so much, Barry. So we're gonna start with Brooke. Uh, Brooke is from California. She's 15, uh, speaks eloquently um, from my conversations with Brooke. Uh, I'm really um, amazed by you, your poise with talking about things. So please, everyone, um, listen to Brooke's story. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Brooke Meshiko. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of what happened to me. So this happened back in, tw I want to say 2018. I was 10 years old at the time, so it happened five years ago. And so I go to school in Santa Monica, California. So my school district is Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District. And a little backstory that will help the conversation. My school, we have um, a school email and we have a student ID number. And those act as our username and password to get into our Chromebooks to do schoolwork and things. So what happened to me is that these two boys at my school thought it was hilarious to, and they found out that it, they knew about my email and my six digit ID number and they basically they logged into my account they went into my email and they sent hurtful messages to other people like a previous teacher uh, another classmate in our class and some other people from my account so when I first heard about this, it was from a fifth grade te another fifth grade teacher at the school. And he showed me a picture of the email. And he's like, do you know about this? I said, no, I have absolutely no idea. No idea how this got sent out. And I would never say anything mean to anybody, especially on the internet. And I was surprised. It took me, it took me by surprise that this fifth grade teacher thought I did something like that. So I kept telling him, no, I didn't do it. And his exact words to me about a few times in our conversation, you either did it or you didn't. And I told him again, I didn't do it. And he didn't believe me after the fifth time I told him. So then I went home, I told my dad about it and we got people involved to finally find out who did this and it was, these two boys in my class, one of them lives across the street from me, and we sat down with them, and they basically said they just thought it was a big joke, and they were hanging out one day, and they just logged into my school account. So that's kind of my story, and then we went to the superintendent and the principal of our school district, and they didn't really do much about it. The punishment to the boys was nothing, and that's why we're here today to teach everybody what to do when that happens again. 
Thanks, Brooke. So one of the things that we talked about was um, looking back now, mm -hmm. what would you have done? What would you do now to, to talk to yourself when you were 10 years old? What would you have s say to yourself when this was happening to you? I think if this was happening to me now as my 10 year old self, I would just say be strong because there was a lot of times back then where teachers didn't believe me, classmates didn't believe me, and mind you, I was in fifth grade. So if this happened to me now, just be like, be strong. I know people. Back then I knew who to go to to help me, but I just would be try to figure out what happened and just everything happen and just be strong, you know? Thank you. And Lieutenant Rivera, what would you, how would you jump in on this, on, on Brooke's story? Uh, it's a great story, great job, Brooke. Um, combating cyberbullying is, it's a team sport. There's no one entity that's gonna kinda take control and, you know, this is what we're gonna do. It's, it's gonna be a collaborative effort. And it starts, obviously, with the victim and that, that Brooke was able to go to her parents and kind of explain, that's a huge step because a lot of times that doesn't happen and it really snowballs until you can kind of get a handle on what's going on. In this particular case, and cyberbullying takes a lot of forms. Everybody knows it. Everybody's been a victim of some, this isn't new. Uh, it's been around since the beginning of time. You know, somebody's said something about somebody, somebody prank called somebody. This has been around forever and it's, Unfortunately, probably not going anywhere. It's something that's in human nature, but we do need to know what to do uh, in, in order to combat it, in order to provide services if necessary for the victims uh, and educate those around us. But here, this is a serious crime. Granted, they're in fifth grade, right? And what's being talked about here is the same thing the other panels were talking about. This is an email compromise. This is unauthorized use of a computer. This is computer trespass. This is, these are serious, serious felony crimes that are happening here. Granted, it's a fifth grader. Now, this is something that the school is identifying. There, and, and, and that's another complication that comes into this, and this is where the parents have to come in, because the school has two roles, one, they have to protect the students. They have to protect themselves also. So they're in a kind of a, a balance there. So often, they're gonna kind of want this to go away. Um, they don't wanna make a big thing. They don't want a big mark. And it's very similar to what uh, Victoria was talking about in the last panel, where when you go to the police, it's, oh my God, my reputation, my reputation. And they're thinking the same thing. So it's important that the parents are involved and it's important that you get the school involved and when necessary, because I don't want to say that it's always necessary to get law enforcement involved. It depends on the circumstance. You know, little problems have smaller solutions. Bigger problems need bigger solutions. People don't like law enforcement. People don't like the police because when you invite me to the party, I come there and I pop the balloons. Right, something bad's going to happen, and sometimes people don't like that. Um, so s sometimes we can solve the problem without involving us. But when you can't, um, just like I, I think the gentleman in the first panel is talking about logs. Really, what that is is information. Um, you need to know what your children are doing. You need to know what platforms they're on. You need to know what usernames they're using. You need to know what's on their phone. Because when we have to come and start an investigation, those are gonna be the questions that we're going to be asking. Communication is key. It's like you working at some Fortune 500 company, moving to another company, and saying, okay, I, I know what I was doing there. Well, we do things differently in this organization. You're gonna need somebody to help guide you through so that you can make the right decisions in your new position. It's gonna take a little while, right? You're not gonna know where the men's room is. Where do I go to have lunch? Things like that are gonna be difficult for you because you're new. And it's the same thing when we walk into any investigation. We need to get, get cooperation from the parties that are involved. That, that's the victim, that's the parents, that's the school, and what happens when, you know, 
and, and this is unfortunate, but happens often, that victim doesn't want to come forward. They're ashamed, they're embarrassed, they're uncomfortable. Uh, and that's where, and, and we don't want to re-victimize them again. We want to take an approach where they're comfortable with what's happening. And that's where we need the parents, the guardians, the teachers, the school to help us. And it can be difficult. Um, when everything lines up, you know, it, it works a lot smoother than, you know, obviously when you're getting difficulty, and this happens. We get difficulty, um, you know, difficult school districts where they don't want to cooperate. You know, if their tires get slashed and they want the police to come and it's the school teacher's tire or the principal's tire, you're going to get all the cooperation in the world. But if this is going to be a black mark or if this is going to be publicity or if this is going to be a newspaper story where, you know, school X, Y, and Z didn't help the student, they didn't give them the, that's bad. And they're not going to like that. But when you come to us earlier, before something kind of mushrooms, or you try to handle it before it mushrooms and you're successful, that's great. But the minute that it starts to look like this is not going the way that we needed, then you have to look for outside help. And I mentioned earlier uh, about the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, and that is a national task force. There is an agency in every single state. There's a task force in every single state, maybe two, three, four, five, depending on the size of the state. There are two in the state of New York. There's one that covers, you know, the metropolitan area, the, the five, and then we also have uh, the state police, which cover the other uh, surrounding counties, like Nassau, Suffolk, and Westchester County, and we're fortunate to have a great relationship with them. Because I know, listen, some people, commute to their schools, they may go to a private school, they may live in Westchester County, or they may live in Nassau and come into a school that w we have a very close relationship uh, where we can, we communicate with each other. And we have a close relationship nationally too, because cyberbullying, it, it's not just about the student that uh, is in your classroom. It, there are no borders here. Um, we're talking national and international and we have contacts and we have uh, cooperation from international. Now, obviously, that becomes a little bit more difficult, you know, doing things internationally, but nationally, we have a very, very, very close network um, across, and it's not just the local or the state police departments, there are other agencies involved. You know, and things that, agencies you might not consider, United States Postal Inspection Service, United States Secret Service, um, there are a lot of different agencies that are kind of involved and cooperating for that common goal of identifying the, the, the actors, um, providing education for maybe the local school districts, even for the parents, because it's important for them to know. Like I said, it's a team sport combating it. It's not enough for the, for the child victim to know, hey, listen, you need to tell somebody but we need to get the message across. We need to be aware of it. We need to see what the identifiers are. Maybe the school grades have gone down. Maybe they don't wanna you know, play video games anymore because they're being bullied on, on one of these platforms. Thank you for all of that. Barry, do you have any, any thoughts? A few years ago, I had to uh, help my wife with a health insurance issue. It was frustrating for her. It was frustrating for me. But we got it resolved, and she asked me, what does somebody do who's not married to a lawyer? And that's kind of how I felt about Brooke. Uh, when I first met her online three years ago, Jason introduced us, and we did a webinar where she told her, her story. What, is, what does a, a kid do whose dad is not a force in the uh, cyber uh, data industry and somebody who's willing to go to the mat to, uh, to help his daughter. And that, that's, really, that's really what it takes. As Felix said, there's, there's, there's three people involved in this, this triangle. There's, there's the victim, it's, often there's the school, and, and then there's the parent. And one of the things we talked about uh, beforehand was how much help you're gonna get from the school is gonna vary. There are some schools that are, are very aware of what's going on with this and are taking steps to try to prevent or help deal with 
cyberbullying when it happens, but you can't always can't always count on that as a parent or I've got a 16-year-old grandson who, who loves social media, so believe me, I keep an eye on his as well. But, um, you know, that's, that's what it takes. You, you may need to know somebody in the business, but um, uh, that's kind of what we're here about in this meeting is to introduce all of us to somebody in the business if we're not already there. Thanks, Barry. Um, could you tell us, are there any federal laws governing cyberbullying? There really aren't, and in general, I mean, I shouldn't say there are no federal laws that, that directly bear on cyberbullying. Um, there are a number of federal laws that could apply to a cyberbullying incident. There are a number of federal laws that, that deal with uh, privacy and data that um, is, is held by uh, minors, uh, held by students, but right now, the, the legislation in, in bullying and cyberbullying in particular is with the states, 48 of 50 states now have uh, laws that, that deal with this. Um, and the, the approach, it, it, we've got a lot of people here who've been in, in the data and privacy industry for a long time. So they know that the approach has kind of been dealing with what happens after a breach. Um, you've heard a lot today about prevention, and that seems to be the trend in the, the state legislation. They're following the model of um, the European law, the, the uh, general data protection rule that's been in place for a few years. Uh, they're trying to put more control in the hands of what they call the data owner. Um, it, you know, so many people collect data for so long, and that's not their main business, but eventually, uh, you know, Amazon or somebody else like that looks around and say, hey, we've got this big pile of data. What can we do with this? Let's sell it, or, you know, let's, let's trade it or whatever. Let's, let's, let's use it. And, and the, the, the European uh, approach is to say, okay, wait a minute. What was the reason you collected that data in the first place? and limit your use to that. So that's, that's some of the approach that's going on now. Uh, Illinois just passed a statute. Uh, you heard Carolyn uh, earlier today talk about their Biometric uh, Information Protection Act, but they, their Cyberbullying Act, it, it really aims at, at three things. First of all, the school districts need to publish their procedures on handling cyberbullying incidents on the internet. So parents can see, you know, you, you can have some idea, what does is, what is my child's school do when something like this happens? The second thing is the schools have to inform the parents if there is a cyberbullying incident. Um, I think, if I remember right, if, if uh, Jason had had to count on his daughter's school to report that incident, he might never have heard about it. But um, 24 hours, you heard the importance of speed in this area. And anybody who's ever uh, been a breach coach or worked with a breach coach knows how important those first 24 hours are. Well, that's the, the same in this field, and that's what the Illinois statute requires. If, if your child has been the, the victim of a cyberbullying incident, school needs to inform you within 24 hours. There's so much more you can do um, in the early stages of something like this, before, before the information gets trampled, before the metadata gets trampled, uh, and that kind of thing. And, and then the, the last thing the Illinois statute requires is for the schools to collect and collect non-identifiable data, they call it, anonymized data, and report it to the state. So the, the state can start keeping track of these kinds of incidents and what they may have in common, what, um, what elements they may be able to um, uh, legislate against or law enforcement officers might be able to use in uh, future cyberbullying attacks. So that's, that's really the trend in legislation right now. Thank you. So um, Lieutenant Rivera, 
educating police, do you have any thoughts on uh, to share with everyone about um, what the, the police officers uh, you know, know about cyberbullying and anything about that? That's a tough one. Um, only because, n not to minimize this, because I know it's important to everyone. It's even important to that patrol officer. I'm sure he, see, he or she sees it uh, maybe personally uh, in, their, in their daily lives. But the, and, and this is generally the community. Um, and basically, the people in this country see the police department as the answer to all their problems. I'll just call the police, they'll fix it. Uh, the water is leaking in the bathroom. You know what, call 911. Maybe somebody will come and they'll turn the water off for me. And I, you know, some people are laughing out there. It's, that's true. That, that, is, that, I, that is no exaggeration of the truth. There are a lot of people um, in this world that use the police to fix their everyday problems um, because they can't handle it. And the truth is, and I know you see it because I know that everybody here is on the internet and watch, we're overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed and we're understaffed across the country. Um, we try to, in, in our agency, um, and this is very new, uh, and it's probably you know, something that came out of COVID, right? You're all, all the meetings that you go to now, it's like, oh, I have a meeting at 10 o'clock tomorrow. I have a You're not going anywhere, right? It's a Teams meeting, or it's on Zoom. Or it's like, I ha oh, I'm busy, uh, I have a meeting, I don't know if I can make that uh, because I have a, you, you, no one's going to meetings anymore. But we're, we're using that too. Um, and we have what's called a virtual roll call. And it's basically the entire police department is watching somebody tell them, hey, let's talk about cyberbullying today and let's talk about what we can do. And Make no mistake, she's just only giving you one snippet of what cyberbullying can be. It can be a lot of different things. And some of the ones, the, some of the trends that we're seeing now are far more serious than that. And that's what everybody commonly knows as catfishing. The most beautiful girl in the world or the most handsome man, you know, suddenly is interested in me and, you know, wants me to send pictures and they're sending pictures uh, to me and all of a sudden, next thing you know, the entire school is getting, you know, compromising or intimate photos of me and now what? What do I do? And the message in the past was don't do it. Don't take pictures of yourself. Don't send anybody pictures. That's like saying I'm on a diet. No. I'm not going to eat that because it's going to make me fat. Or, I, I, you know what, I don't want that because uh, there's too much sugar in it. I'm watching my weight. I'm watching my health. But you do it anyway, right? You make that mistake and you're like, oh, I won't do it next time. Well, they do the same thing, right? They take that intimate photo and they're like, we need to start pushing the message out there that that's not the end of the world. You took that photo. You sent it out um, because we're having tragic consequences across the country, across the world, when people make a mistake and they don't know what to do. And I'm not saying that it's gonna be easy to fix it, but there is a fix for everything. For every mistake that you make, there is always a fix. You can come back from anything. I say this all the time in my agency, you can make the biggest mistake in the world, all you need is time. Some, don't forget about it and you'll move on. You'll move on, all you need is time time and some services, and we can help you with that too. Um, we can get those images down that are posted, but it takes time and it's uncomfortable and it's a difficult thing to do, but there, there is a solution. Um, and I don't want anybody to go back home and tell their children, oh, don't do this. If you do this, then, then what? No, we're done. You've ruined your life. You'll never get a job. You'll never get it. It's not true. You, you, cannot, you cannot send that message out because it comes with tragic consequences. We have to say, tell me, I'll, we'll fix it. It'll take us time, it'll be difficult, but we'll help you. And that's where parents come in. Parents have to help them too. We need your help, we always need your help. When any law enforcement comes into your business to do an investigation, we need your help. I don't know what your logs are. I don't know what the day to day is. I don't know what the anomalies are. Show me those. Show me, show me the anomalies. Show me, show me everything you have. We'll look through it together and we'll find. Conducting investigations, 
any investigations is about finding a mistake. And none of us here are perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. We all do, and that's what we look, on, look for and we capitalize on those. Any crime, robbery, homicide, did they get caught by video? Online investigation, were they using a VPN but they were so sloppy that they just jumped to it and the VPN didn't kick in? Maybe we have a good IP that we can follow back. So it's all about looking for that mistake that we all make and it's okay to make mistakes and that's the message that we have to give the victims. That's really important, thank you. Brooke, did you want to add anything? Yeah, to add to Lieutenant Rivera, I've asked myself, what's a piece of advice I give to people who are being cyberbullied or to parents? I would give an advice. How many of you guys in the crowd, how many of you have children? Children? How many of them are in school right now? Because I'm in high school and like, okay. I would just talk to your children and just tell them about, not to, pre, not to totally prevent it, just for have them to be knowledgeable. Not all school districts, such as mine, talk about cyberbullying. I know mine just did one slideshow and that was it. It's important for parents because parents are very involved. It's important for parents to talk to their children about what could happen. Be careful, but also you don't have to not do it at all. So I think just talking to your children and telling them about what it is and who you can go to is important. Thanks. Barry, any, anything to add? When, whenever you do a presentation like this, you always learn more. Um, then, then you uh, end up uh, telling people about. But when I first heard Lieutenant Rivera talk about this, uh, I think that was the most important thing that came out of our preparation was you know, we put so much emphasis on prevention and don't let this happen that the only message that could come across is if you let it happen, your life is over. And some people take, you know, some children have taken that literally. And, and that's, so if, if you remember nothing else from this seminar, I think that point that Yes, we need to talk about prevention, and, and, and we need to work hard at it, but there are things that can be done if you are a victim, and um, uh, getting, getting people in touch with those that can help them and um, knowing what can be done after an event like this is extremely important to uh, not be trapped in that first message that's all or nothing. Yeah, does anybody have any questions um, for anyone up here? I was just going to say, on your note, Barry, yes, it's also important that we as a society and a group of educated adults um, resist the temptation to click on the temptation to pass on the pictures or pass on the gossip because once it gets involved in the room, you know, it also takes on a life of its own. And so, like, that's that's a good point. For those of you who might not have been able to hear, the the point was act like a grown up. If 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 somebody sends you some of these pictures, don't pass them on. Uh, delete them. Be responsible. Um, you know that um, that's that's one that's one way to help deal with the problem is is not not to be a purveyor. Do you have a question? Yeah. It's Brooke. I want to say thank you for coming and talking to us today. It's very great of you to do so. I think you should Barry, thank you very much for your work with respect to what you do. It's, it's very important. The message is very much one that needs to be heard because just the other week I heard a young man who uh, was part of this extortion uh, uh, event where he had sent pictures to someone who would need to be uh, a young lady who turned out not to be, and he was extorted. And, and that's a problem because he thought the only way out was to kill himself and did. So that's, that's not right. The other thing is, as attorneys, uh, we have to start, well, those attorneys that are in the room, we need to start offering our assistances to those that can't defend themselves in these situations. And there are paths to 
uh, forcing cyber bullies to take it seriously. Many of them either directly sued the bullies, what the minors, they can be sued, or number two, sued their parents. And the causes of action are going to be defamation, it's going to be false light, or it's going to be under one of the statutes that, uh, that sir, I'm sorry. That's all right. Name. It's Barry. Barry. That Barry mentioned with respect to uh, state cyber bullying laws. So there are courses of action here. And if you're putting the school on notice that they have a problem, and then it's not only going to come with the school's problem, but their insurance carrier's problem, you will see results. So thank you again. And to, to your second point there, um, you heard some discussion about ransomware this morning, and, and we've watched that evolve from, uh, you know, send me $300 worth of Bitcoin and you'll get your data back to uh, demands in the millions of dollars. And that evolution has happened even more quickly with cyberbullying. You know, it, it, uh, the, the, the incident you mentioned involving sextortion, you know, that's essentially organized crime that's um, that, that's doing that so where they see profit the they start to ratchet up the pressure so that um, the the criminals are endlessly adaptive that's what we learned in the ransom world uh, ransomware world and the only only thing we can do is try to be as adaptable um, the big challenge right now and we're going to hear about it in the next program we've heard about it before is AI um, that was my own future shock moment uh, as those of you who remember that book the author talked about the pace of change and how uh, eventually it reaches such a, a pace that people can't adapt to it uh, I first heard about chat GPT in November and I thought hmm that's that's something I'm gonna have to keep an eye on three or four months later there are already lawyers in trouble with the Bar Association for letting chat GPT write their briefs. So it's, it, it, it's happening quickly, and that's the job of, of parents is to keep up with what's going on. Did anybody, Julia? Yes. Um, so we were talking about laws recently that sort of combat um, cyberbullying. So a lot of cyberbullying happens on social media, and I know that our firm um, was recently discussing a bill that was proposed um, regarding the use of social media for anybody under the age of 13. Um, so, you know, so far hasn't been passed, but I know that we're uh, sort of monitoring it. Um, the bill is essentially saying that anybody under the age of 13 would need to have parental guidance to start social media accounts, which will sort of counter cyberbullying Thanks. Lieutenant, do you um, have any comments on that and if, if it would be effective? It's, it's complicated, very complicated. Um, you know, the social media platforms already put out terms of service um, with regard to use of their platforms. And it's, it's complicated because the freedoms that we want to grant our citizens um, it's complicated because they also operate globally uh, and they can't or they can or it's difficult to have a different set of rules for the US, a different set of rules for Europe. Um, and we've already run into a lot of con you know, convoluted issues uh, along the way with that. And we're still dealing this. This is a, this is dealing with social media. It's evolved, you know, tremendously over the last just decade, and it's expected to evolve again. So what we think of now, or what we use now and how we use it, is likely not going to be the way that we use it in 10 years. And that's what makes this so difficult. We're a very litigious, um, you know, nation. I'm sure, you know, for all the lawyers that are in here, that's good for you. Um, but because it takes so long for change and because everybody is combating change and it's not quick and fluid like social media and technology are, we're always playing catch up. And that's what makes that so difficult. Do I think it will be? I hope it will be. I hope everything you know, will get better, but 
it's a, it's a tall mountain to climb for sure. Thanks. Um, Jason, did you have a comment that maybe you'd want to share? Can you talk about BARC really quickly before we adjourn? I think all of the parents in this audience and this conference are supposed to know what BARC is. So I didn't say it. Jason said it because I, I don't endorse or recommend any products, certainly not publicly. Um, however, you know, I said earlier that it's important for parents, guardians, um, to know what's going on, uh, on, on their, on their, uh, with their kids on the internet, on social media. And there are a variety of different um, programs that can help you monitor it. And there's some automation to it, just like you have your systems monitored at, uh, you know, for exploits, you know, in, in your corporations, right? Just j the same way that you do that, um, we're looking for some kind of hygiene in your kids' social media and internet activities. And look, I don't want to read all my emails. I think there's like 150 of them that I haven't gotten to today, right? And I'm sure you don't either. But having something like Bark or another program to help alert you when there might be a problem, just to get you to focus in and look at it and say, you know what, I need to take a minute and see what's going on here because I just got an alert that there may be an issue. And that could help you, you know, it can help you make a decision to say, hey, listen, I don't like this communication. This communication's not going to be there. And I'm going to go into the settings of this tool and I'm not going to allow any more communications on this platform or any communications with this person. Um, and we need that because we're all busy. We're, we're drinking information from a fire hose and that's difficult. Um, and just like you need to protect your organizations um, with an incident response team, with somebody to come and look at how things, you need to do the same thing at home. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you again, Lutan and Brooke, Barry. This was really nice to, to be able to talk to everyone here today.